Hi, uh, this is the IEEE Power and Energy Society at Berkeley's seminar series. And uh, this week, we're delighted to welcome Professor Arajit Banerjee from uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, Professor Banerjee completed his bachelor's uh, in, uh, from the Indian Institute of Engineering Science and Technology in Shibpur, India, and the master's degree from IIT in Karagpur, India and the PhD from MIT in 2016. He's currently an assistant professor at UIUC uh, in electrical and computer engineering, and he's made a number, number of uh, contributions to the analysis, design, and control of electromechanical energy conversion systems. Uh, we're delighted to host him today for his talk, Integrated Permanent Magnet Synchronous Generator Rectifier Architecture for Offshore Wind. Okay, take it away, Professor Banerjee. Thank you so much, uh, Keith, for that uh, kind introduction. And again, glad to be here with you all. Uh, thanks so much. It's uh, an honor to present uh, this work uh, in front of you all. So today I'll talk about this integrated permanent magnet synchronous generator rectified architecture for offshore wind. Uh, this is a part of our project, which we are working uh, with, uh, with the funding from ARPA-E. But before I go into details of what exactly is uh, this project all about, I want to give you guys a general uh, overview of what is the direction of research we enjoy working. And that basically gives us uh, the research philosophy, what I strongly believe in, what are the problems we like to tackle. And from there, we can uh, we will go into details of, of uh, this, uh, this particular project. So the general area of research which I enjoy working is, as many of you may already know, is in this combined domain of power electronics, electric machines, and control. So, at the end of the day, there are so many applications all over the place where we are taking energy either from uh, electrical and converting it into a mechanical domain or vice versa. And of course, as for, as for the talk for today, you can think about uh, wind turbines are exactly where we are taking energy from the mechanical side and putting it into the grid. But there are other emerging areas as well, not just wind turbines and offshore wind. Think about electric vehicle, transportation, electrification in general, robotics, or if it is industrial automation, uh, of course, renewable energy and so on. So the basic architecture of this combination of electrical and mechanical systems, that's where we enjoy working. Now, the first question which comes to us in the mind is, okay, what people do and what is that kind of problem, how we want to look at the problem? So typically, the approach we take when we look at the systems where we want to convert energy from one domain to another is what I call as divide and conquer. So we would like to attack individual pieces and try to optimize them as best as we can, because at the end of the day, this entire piece is a very complex mechanism. So the approach of divide and conquer pretty much works very well because we can optimize the power electronics, we can optimize the machine, and of course, build control uh, framework around it. So that approach works pretty well. But the way we want to frame the problem or we want to look at the problem is more at the integration and customization level. So what do I mean by integration? It's not physical integration by itself. It's not about, okay, let's place our power converters right next to machine or on the machine. We are not talking about just physical uh, integration. We are talking about functional integration. Is there a way to better integrate the things we can achieve with power electronics? Say, for example, chopped waveforms. How does machine takes care of those chopped the DC to AC waveform? How can we optimize the machine? And same thing with the control. Can we all look at it from a system perspective here and see the, how each of these elements influence other? So that's the approach which we really love to pursue. And of course, it has applications in all of these diverse domains. And when we talk about this approach, it makes uh, our life very interesting, very intriguing, but also very challenging. And you can see here some of the examples of these challenges. Sometimes we have to build our own machine because the machine doesn't exist. So you can see on the right side, we have built a one horsepower brushless doubly fed reluctance machine. I don't know how many of you will be knowing this machine, but that doesn't matter. But we have to build the machine because that machine doesn't exist in off the shelf components. So we have to go and design the machine, build the machine. On the right side on top, you can see there is a distributed actuation. We'll talk about it briefly. We have to go and build the actuator. On the left side, sometimes we have to build the converter because the converter which we want to get adapted to this kind of integrated design 
doesn't exist. So on the top, you can see there is a ongoing work. This is part of the project which we will discuss today. Is a hundred kilowatt inverter for uh, ARPA E project. And on the bottom, you can see this uh, again a GAN con based converter uh, where we have eighteen phases coming out so that we can interface with the machine of an eighteen phase machine rather than a three phase machine. And sometimes all of these things come with an added complexity that we create a nightmare, nightmare for our control. So you can see here some weird trajectories in uh, state plane, and we love looking at these things. So the picture I'm trying to project here, which I think you will appreciate here, is some all of these pieces are moving pieces. And when we try to look at it from a system where there are interactions between power electronics machines and control, we have to think from a very simultaneous perspective. We cannot divide and conquer and try to achieve everything what is possibly uh, we can achieve when we are looking at it from this integrated and customized way. So let me give some examples before we move on to the wind turbine piece, okay? So we talked about, there are, as I said, like there are many, many applications. Let's focus on two, three applications before we dive down into the offshore wind turbine topic, particularly. Let's look at this electric vehicle, okay? Uh, let's take one example on electric vehicle. So we want to say, for example, make a drive train, which will take a DC bus, and we want to run it uh, through a power converter, an inverter, and then we extend it to the electric machine, and that's going to turn the wheel. So if you look at the question we are asking here is, can we do it with induction machine? And the reason to that is most of the world today run their power converters and their drive train with permanent magnet based machine. There is only a slight uh, chunk where people try to use induction machine, but the majority of these applications look at PM machines. So why are we going towards induction machine? The reason is if you look at the cost and uh, the fluctuation in supply chain, particularly from permanent magnets, it's a lot. And as we try to electrify the drive train with permanent magnet based machine, there will be a huge requirement on all of these permanent magnets, which are pretty much and very uh, uh, restricted to some places of art. It's not freely available material. So induction machine is a nice uh, alternative, but the problem why people can't do it with induction machine, why you see this tiny slice of people being using this induction machine is it cannot meet the torque speed characteristic what we need for an EV requirement. So as you can see here, the black dotted curve is what the torque speed characteristic we need for a, a EV, EV perspective. But a typical induction machine will give something like this blue curve. And what you see here at the maximum speed, we will never be able to achieve the torque requirement. So we will need almost like twice X the improvement from the current state of art to achieve the torque speed characteristic. So what's the way out? Either you over-design the machine or you over-design the drive so that you can reach this uh, uh, requirement on maximum speed. So you see, this is the classical approach of divide and conquer, where we don't worry about power electronics and machine and machine in power electronics. And we will run into a problem like this, that we have to oversize the drive or the machine to uh, solve the problem. Obviously, no one is going to put more machines or more materials into our electric vehicle. We are moving towards high power density and high reliability and high efficiency game. So this is not a uh, good solution. And that's the reason why you see this tiny slice of uh, applications or uh, where we see induction machine based drives. What we came up with, and this is part of uh, the thing we were talking about, is try to change the pole of the machine on the fly. It's almost like changing the gear, but rather than a mechanical gear, you change it through electronically inside the machine. So what we did is we built this entire variable pole induction machine associated with it is that 18 phase drive. And now you have individual control in all of these windings. So you can excite it in a much more efficient as well as much more uh, interesting way intelligently so that you can change the pole of the machine. And if we do this, Again, we are talking about an integrated approach here. We can not only meet the torque speed requirement, but also we can reduce the converter VA rating by 50%, uh, loss by 45%, and DC link capacitance by 62%. So this is an example. I won't go into details of what goes into this entire project. That's probably a topic in itself uh, to discuss for another uh, time. But all I'm trying to say is that what we can achieve when we think about it in an integrated way uh, is much more than if we just optimize at individual component level. So another example I would like to pick up is a favorite example for me is on a robotic side. 
So as you can see here on the left is a, is an athlete here. He's a gymnast. She's a gymnast here, and you can do. She, you can see that she's doing a backflip here. Okay. Compared to this is an Atlas robot, which is doing the exactly same thing. Now let's take a moment to see this for a second. Okay. And you see here, look at Atlas how it takes the backflip versus how this athlete does it. Okay. And you can see the use of spine in robots. It's really amazing to see how the distributed actuation of the spine helps to have this nice agile motion, which is almost impossible for uh, Atlas. Again, Atlas has done fantastic uh, things. It has achieved amazing feat. When you look at some of these cool YouTube videos, it's just amazing to see how what has uh, been possible with all the hardware and uh, control architectures for Atlas. But still, if you think about it, purely from a biological, uh, from an inspiration uh, perspective, the spine is missing. And that's another direction where we were looking at or where we are looking at is this part of an NSF project, this is part of my NSF career project, where we are looking at distributed actuation as well as distributed power electronics. Again, same philosophy that we can excite individual coils and we can achieve much more compared to what a conventional machine will give. So if you look at the stress, what I mean by that, this is the uh, force per unit area we can generate in a conventional similar sized machine. We are talking about almost a huge possibility in terms of what stress we can do in terms of propose. And this mimics almost what is possible through biological mus muscles. So if we can have a distributed actuation with the similar uh, principle, we can achieve to high torque to weight ratio compared to what conventional actuators can do. It's still a work in progress and maybe Another day, I can give a talk on just by itself. I'll tell you, this is a nightmare in terms of the control. Like, uh, we are creating so much nonlinearity in the system. It's a nightmare. But that said, uh, we are trying to solve these control problems. And you can see here uh, one animation of a spine. This is with the control and everything. As you can see here, this is where we are trying to do a swing motion of the spine. And it's, it's a highly nonlinear system. Uh, the control is a nightmare, but that's where the fun is. When there is a, a challenge in terms of control, it makes our life very intriguing. So here we are doing kind of a snake motion and swing motion. So the third example is where we will dive in is the offshore wind. And you will see very similar uh, philosophy of integration of machine, power electronics, and control, but customized for offshore wind. So the first question which comes to our mind, obviously, is why do we care about offshore wind? Why can't we live with all the winds we have here? There are plenty of solar. Why should we care about even offshore wind? And I think uh, Robert will immediately appreciate there is a lot of activity going on right now in Europe, in particular for offshore wind. So let's look at the case, what is happening with US, OK? So there is a huge potential of energy we can capture from offshore wind, particularly in US, OK? Uh, it is uh, based on the data we have, it's the amount of uh, wind energy available to us, if we can capture all of it, it's almost like the twice the entire US annual energy consumption. And this is very interesting because one of the primary reason why we want to go to offshore compared to onshore uh, wind turbines is the steadiness of the wind. Offshore, it's land is much more freely available, and you can put up a wind turbine. Wind is much steadier, so you won't have those weird fluctuations of your wind, and that will re result in less fluctuation in how much power you can harvest. So that's the basic motivation of why you want to go to offshore wind. But this comes with the severe challenges, right? Because now I have to put up wind turbines which are on the sea. So how do we do that? That's a question we need to address. So let's look at that's the potential. Where are we, particularly in US, as of now? So in terms of where we are in offshore wind turbine, today we have around 42 megawatts of wind turbines uh, installed for in US, OK? Where do we want to go? We want to have something like 26 gigawatt installed in next uh, 15 to 20 years. So you can imagine we are at 42 megawatt, and we want to go to 26 gigawatt, OK? Let's just try to understand that difference. When I was a kid, okay, 21, uh, uh, I don't know, maybe 128 MB RAM was a big deal, okay? Today we talk about 64 gigs of RAM. We, uh, we are talking about like 20, 25 years kind of time frame in memory, right? 128 MB RAM versus 64 gigs of RAM. Similar kind of achievement we need to have in offshore wind right now to push the needle from 42 megawatt 
to 26 gigawatt of wind turbines and harvesting energy from offshore wind. So that's a huge challenge. And people are stepping up. So if you look at all the installments, uh, installations right now, all the manufacturing, there is a lot of uh, high power wind turbines being developed right now. Uh, Haliadex, to mention one of them, GE is making it, again, 15, 16, gigawatt, uh, 16 megawatt wind turbine. Uh, some of them are from Vestas and so on and so forth. Everybody is making high power wind turbines so that we can install it uh, offshore. So now let's take a step back and ask, okay, what's the problem? Why can't we just build this wind turbine and put it on offshore? Why can't we do that? And the fundamental reason, if you think about it, is the levelized cost of electricity. So if you compare the levelized cost of electricity based on other energy sources, offshore wind is really, really still very high, okay? We are almost talking about 12 cents per uh, kilowatt hour here compared to other sources which are much cheaper. So if we really have to get the energy from offshore wind turbines back to our grid, we have to reduce the levelized cost of electricity. So let's ask for a question here, how do we reduce levelized cost of electricity? Well, what is levelized cost of electricity? I have cost over annual energy production. And what is the cost? It's two parts. One is fixed cost and one is the operation and maintenance cost. And it has to be reduced. Of course, we want to go down, so the cost has to be reduced. And we want to increase our annual energy production. So how do we do that? So if we want to reduce the operation and maintenance cost, the first thing we need to do is to we have to make the system reliable. It cannot fail. And think about it. It's very important in an offshore environment, if one of the units fail, if one of the power converters fail, or if anything fails in the system, someone has to go and plan a visit somewhere like, I don't know, five miles, 10 miles, 20 miles, wherever that offshore wind turbine is, in a very weird environment, go and repair that. It's not a cheap uh, or a inexpensive uh, uh, situation. So we have to make the system reliable such that, such that it doesn't fail. How do we reduce the fixed cost? Now here, the game plan, again, think about it. We have a wind turbine, which is offshore. Most likely, it has to be floating. Okay, we cannot put a lot of base and connect it to the ground. It's a floating offshore wind turbine. So if it is floating, the lot, most of the cost will be on the base and how we are going to make it float. But apart from our side, what we can do is reduce the weight of the machine and power converter together. Because if we can reduce the weight on the electromechanical drivetrain, that will reduce the requirement on the nacelle weight, and that will reduce the weight on the tower and the base and so on. So if we want to reduce the fixed cost, we have to reduce the weight. So of course, we have to go for a higher power density. And the last piece, if how do we go to annual energy production? We have to make the system efficient. So it comes down to high power density, high reliability, and high efficiency. That's what we care about from the electromechanical drivetrain. And if we can achieve those three features simultaneously without sacrificing one or the other, then we can reduce the LCOE in a, in, a, in a drastic way. So what the architecture we will be talking about today is, a, again, going back to our fundamental premise, fundamental approach of how do we look at machine power electronics control together is what we call this gener integrated generator rectifier architecture. And you will see at the end that if we do the architecture in this way, we can reduce the power processing by 75% compared to a conventional system. Uh, uh, size by 30%, loss by 60%. And the mo most interesting piece to me is the failure rate that goes by 9x. And that's what got ARPA -E super at attracted to this kind of philosophy of a high reliable system without sacrificing efficiency or power density. So we'll talk about this architecture and I'll go into details of it. But before we get down to the details of this architecture, let's take a step back and understand what is the current state of art. What are the possible options we have and why do we need this architecture? So there are two basic options we have right now to harvest energy from wind, okay? One is based on WFED induction generator. This is basically the workhorse for most of the onshore wind turbines. And what's the basic principle? Again, we don't want to go into details of machines or anything at this point. From a purely from architecture standpoint, what happens? You harvest energy from this wind turbine. There is a gearbox. This is a high-speed machine. So you convert the gear, uh, speed here to a higher speed here. And this machine, the speciality of this machine is it has two windings. One is on the stator side, and one is on the rotor side. The stator is directly connected to the grid through a transformer. The rotor is connected 
through a brush and a slip ring. Because again, remember the winding and the rotor is rotating. So somehow there has to be a mechanical arrangement which will convert this uh, electrical connection which is in the rotating frame into a stationary frame. So when I'm showing these connections here, there is there are brushes and slip rings. And then you have a back-to-back -back converter which gets connected to the grid, okay? So that's an option, uh, first option. So with a gearbox, a doubly fed induction generator, and then I mentioned here about something called as partial power processing. So what do I mean by that? Think about it this way. Imagine there is a 10 megawatt wind turbine, okay? So there is 10 megawatt of power coming into this port, in this mechanical port. Majority of this power can be directly fed from the generator to the grid without being processed by the power electronics. And part of the power has to be processed because at the end we need to have some kind of control. Otherwise, we'll not be able to achieve maximum power point tracking. So this power converter, if we operate with limited speed range, can be reduced almost by 60%. So when I say 10 megawatt wind turbine, this power converter roughly can be one third of 10 megawatt to process the entire power within the operating speed range. So that's a very attractive feature. And that's why this topology is workhorse for onshore wind turbines. But offshore, this is not so great. Why? One primary reason, or two primary reasons. One is the gearbox, okay? The reliability story. Uh, the gearboxes are not that much reliable. And secondly, you need to convert this electrical connections from rotating frame to stationary. So you need brushes and slip ring. Particularly in a saline environment, these connections are not reliable. So you have to replace them often. And that's why this architecture is not great. So people went on to look at the second option. So that's the permanent magnet-based machines. So what do we do here? It's a single port machine. Unlike in doubly fed machine, there are permanent magnets on the rotor. So you don't need any electrical connections. And on the stator, there are three ports. Now, the sacrifice we are doing here is instead of having this partial power being processed by the back-to-back -back converters, we need full power processing to be done by this active rectifier. So if there is a 10 megawatt wind turbine here, our AC to DC or DC to AC has to process 10 megawatt. That's it. Okay. So now let's compare these two options, what we have first, and then see what is missing. What is the question we want to answer? So let's look at, again, what are our, our important parameters to think about our matrix of interest, efficiency, reliability, and power density. Let's think about efficiency-wise. Option one, DFIGs and gearboxes are less efficient compared to direct drive and PMSG. And similarly, since I have to process less power when I'm doing with link with partial power converter, my efficiency, I have less loss in the overall system. So efficiency-wise, what we would like to have is a direct drive, PMSG, and a partial power converter. What about reliability? Gearboxes, as I mentioned, are unreliable. DFIGs, because of their brushes and slip rings, something we need to continuously uh, have some maintenance going on that reduces the reliability piece of it. And in terms of size, again, very similar trend, gearbox and DFIG full power converter will have much bigger size compared to the direct drive and PMSG and partial power converter. But hopefully now you can see a pattern is emerging, okay? If the conventional options we have, we don't like gearbox, we don't like DFIGs, we don't like full power converter. So what we need is basically a direct drive, PMSG and partial con power converter. Now that's impossible, okay? Almost impossible because at the end of the day, fundamentally, you have to convert a AC waveform into a DC waveform. There is no way you can do that with linear circuit elements. So we need nonlinear circuit elements and let's see if we can have an uh, option we can create is which is direct drive, PMSG and partial power processing. So that's the fundamental question we will address in today's talk. How can we create a new option for wind turbine, uh, for particularly for offshore environment? So what is the fundamental bottleneck? So let's look at the conventional approach, okay? Divide and conquer. So we have a generator, and typically we love generators with three-phase outputs, okay? So as you can see here, I've marked with three lines, which indicates it's a three-phase system. And then I have a rectifier, which is, has to be made up with active switches and then we create this DC bus. So that's the conventional divide and conquer approach. So if I have to create this rectifier, I have two options. I cannot do it with linear circuit elements. Either I do it with switching elements, and at this high power level, it is typically IGBTs, and, or we can do it with diodes, okay? 
but diodes doesn't give us control and we will talk about in a moment, but those are the two available devices at this high power. And if you look at the available devices in terms of uh, the voltage and current rating, the blue dots are diodes and the yellow orange squares are the IGBTs. So you can see diodes are typically much higher power rated as well, both in terms of voltage and current compared to IGBTs. IGBTs are typically 6.6 kV max. And here you can see some of them are at 3.3 kV with a little bit of higher current. So you can see if we use dominantly on diode side, more devices are available. So let's ask another question here, okay? What do we need or what do we achieve if we make this rectifier, if we make this rectifier using, uh, using uh, a general, uh, uh, if we make this rectifier using passive diodes? So I have three phase input and then I have this passive rectifier. I don't put any capacitor at the output of this, uh, at, the, at the output of this, uh, passive rectifier. So what do we have? Based on the previous uh, slide where we have a lot of devices in terms of diodes at high power and uh, high voltage and high current, our power capability is much higher. We have much reliable, diodes are more reliable than IGBTs. Power density is high, efficiency high, but we don't have any control. Of course, diode doesn't allow us to control the power flow. And the other option is to connect it with an active rectifier. Here I'm showing a two-level active rectifier. Of course, we can do it with multi-level. And uh, the, you guys are expert in multi-level topics. So of course, we can think about uh, that direction as well. So, But again, let us keep it simple because we are talking about architectures rather than the details of the rectifier per se. But we can say a two-level rectifier. We reduce our power capability, our reliability, our power density, our power and efficiency compared to a diode but what we achieve is the control, which is missing in the, in the passive rectifier. So the question we try to frame is, is there a way we can take advantage of the strengths of the passive diodes and uh, IGBT switches such that we can create an architecture where we have control as well as take advantage of high reliability, power density, and efficiency of the diodes. So this is how this architecture came up, okay? So what do we do? Instead of treating the machine as a three-phase output, we say it's a multi-phase machine. So instead of having only three wires coming out of the machine, imagine you have nine wires coming out of the machine. So each of these ports are three-phase each. We connect each port to a passive rectifier, uh, most of the port except one, and one of the port is connected to the active rectifier. We take the DC bus out of each individual ports and we stack them together and we create the DC bus, okay? So that's why we call this as an integrated generator rectifier architecture. And what the game plan is that there is no capacitors at the output of the diode. Because if you recall, some of you guys have taken 464 with me, and I'm sure you have taken power electronics with Robert. Passive diodes are horrible in terms of power factor on the AC port. So you can see that you can see that uh, these passive rectifiers are like. Uh, we don't want, and one of the reasons why there is a poor power factor at the out input of these passive rectifiers is because of uh, the capacitors at the DC link. So if we can eliminate those capacitors, then we will have much better power factor. In fact, we, what we achieve is around 0.5 or 0.96 in terms of the power factor at the passive ports, even though it's run by passive diodes. So let's now ask questions on this architecture, okay? First is how much better can we do? So we talked about all our metrics and so on, how much better can we do? So let's try to ask that question. Second is, can we achieve control? Because again, recall, most of the power converters in this entire architecture are passive diodes and we cannot control diodes per se. So can we achieve maximum power extraction? And third, is it practically feasible? So let's ask these three questions. So let's ask the first question, how much better can we do? Is it better than our conventional options, what we have already? So the first thing, by doing this architecture, what we have done is created a new degree of freedom in terms of our design. What is that? We have created that we have a flexibility of picking how many ports we want to have. So what we are showing here is a three port, but I can easily construct a four port machine where three of the ports will be connected to passive rectifiers and one port is connected to active rectifier. So the number of ports, each three phase is a degree of freedom in this entire design. Let us try to exploit that new degree of freedom in terms of reducing the active rectifier requirement. Okay, so let's try to go through some details of this. 
let's look at a conventional system. And one thing before we get started on this, I'll restrict the operating speed range in the, of the wind turbine from 0.55 to 1. And this is very standard for doubly fed machines where we are reducing the power electronics. This speed range is good enough. And the prim primary reason is the power you extract from a wind turbine is proportional to the cubic of the rotational speed for a direct drive system. So when you are like half the 0.55 per unit speed, you are like 10% of the rated power. So it's pretty much like a, a, a okay to operate within this limited speed range. And we will exploit this feature. You will see that in a moment. So let's look at a single port machine. What do I mean by that? I have one three phase output and that gets connected to the active rectifier, okay? So this is the conventional system. This is option two, what we talked about. If I think about the voltage rating of this device, okay, what is the voltage rating I have to deal with this for this IGBT? Again, we are talking about two level. It's the same as the DC bus. It is independent of the speed. The active rectifier voltage rating is determined whatever is the DC bus voltage. Let's call it as a one per unit, okay? Now let's bring in a two port system, one with the passive rectifier and one with the active rectifier. And let's try to see what we can do. So, the passive rectifier output voltage is unregulated. We don't have any control. So as the speed goes down, the voltage at the output of the passive rectifier will gradually go down. And if we have to maintain the DC bus voltage here, the active rectifier voltage must increase such that you can maintain the DC bus voltage. So as you can see here on the right side, the as we decrease the speed of the generator, the passive rectifier voltage share goes down while the active rectifier share goes up such that you can reduce, re maintain the DC bus voltage at one per unit. But what is interesting here, the active rectifier voltage rating, you can reduce it from one to something around 0.75. You don't have to deal with one per unit voltage rating. So I can keep going and increasing the number of ports and eventually you will see I'll reach some kind of an asymptotic behavior. As you increase the number of ports, the active rectifier voltage rating requirement, which is determined by the peak at the lowest speed, will go keep going down and down, right? So obviously it seems like the more the number of ports, the better it is from the voltage rating. So we should have infinite number of ports in uh, ideal, right? But that's not true. Why? Because there is another piece to the puzzle is the current rating of the active rectifier. So if I take a single electrical port machine, the current rating is proportional to the square of the speed, and you can see this. So the current rating of the active rectifier will be the peak of the current, which happens at the maximum speed, which is this rating here, whatever is that number. But as I keep increasing the number of ports, this characteristic changes. So for a two port, the current behavior will be like this, three port, four port, and so on. But you can see the peak of the current changes where this, it happens and gradually it starts increasing. So if you have a nine port generator, the current rating requirement is much higher, although you have reduced the voltage rating requirement. So if you want to optimize now the VA rating of this new architecture, particularly the active rectifier side, we have the voltage rating, we have the current rating, and our degree of freedom is number of ports. We take these two numbers, we take a product, and let's see where the minimum is, okay? And this is what exactly we get. So you see here, the single port machine, which is the conventional option two for us, that's our single port machine. And whatever is the rating for our active rectifier VA rating, if we go and use four port machine, we can reduce it almost by 30%. So that's a drastic improvement in terms of the VA rating itself, how much we need from an active rectifier standpoint, if we use a multi-port, uh, a four port rather in this case, it's an optimum for an ideal system, but a multi-port system, we can reduce our VA requirement. But that's not all. The active rectifier, now let's look at the power processed by this active rectifier. So if I look at the incoming wind speed is proportional to the cubic of the speed, the incoming uh, power is basically proportional to the cubic of the wind speed. So if we look at how much power is being processed by the active rectifier and the passive rectifier, the active rectifier processes only 25% of the total power at the rated condition. And that's kind of, obvious if you think about it in a moment, that I have four port system, I have four port system. So when I'm at rated speed, three port power comes from the passive rectifier, so that's 75% and 25% of the power goes through the active rectifier. So think about it in terms of 10 megawatt wind turbine. If I have a 10 megawatt wind turbine running at rated speed, only 250 kilowatt has to be processed by the active rectifier. 
and that reduces the losses in the active rectifier. Now let's look at the loss. Since I'm processing less power through the active rectifier, I can eliminate most of the switching loss. I don't have to deal with the switching loss of the IGBTs. And what I'm left with, I'm processing majority of the power through the diodes. And these diodes are at line frequency. These are not switching frequency diodes. We are talking about a 20 hertz signal, which is going through these uh, diodes. So we can drastically reduce the loss in the converter since we are processing less power. And that gets reflected into the efficiency. So if you compare it with a conventional single port generator, you can reduce the loss by 60% if we use this integrated generator rectifier architecture, purely because you can eliminate a lot of these switching losses. The last piece of the puzzle, so we talked about power density in terms of V-rating, eliminating capacitors. We talked about efficiency. We can get better efficiency. What about the reliability? So again, think about it. We are using majority of these power devices are basically diodes, right? So diodes are inherently much, much more reliable compared to IGBTs based on the data that we have. So if you look at this four port design where majority of this power is being processed by the diodes and we have eliminated the capacitors at these passive ports, the reliability improves drastically. You can see this is the conventional single port generator. This is the uh, failures per year. And uh, again, this work was done with Alejandro Dominguez Garcia's group here. So he's an expert in reliability. So we work with him to get this data. So this is basically his work and uh, outcome of it, their uh, effort here. But what the data shows is that this is the conventional uh, architecture. And you can see why the reliability degrades over the time. This characteristic comes from the capacitance. So imagine you have a full DC bus capacitance. This is what it gets reflected in this gradual uh, change or increase in the uh, failures per year. Compared to the conventional baseline, if you look at the proposed architecture, it has a 9x order of improvement in terms of reliability. So to summarize, we have better uh, VA rating, we have better efficiency, and finally, we have better reliability. And that's what drives us to decrease the LCOE. Let's ask the second question, which is a nightmare question. If you think about it right now, how do we achieve control? We have put so much diodes into the system. We have put so much diode into the system. How do we achieve uh, uh, control? So before we go to control, one thing we, I would like to highlight is since we are having no capacitors at the passive rectifier output, the ripple at that port is really, really high, as you can see here. So the game plan is to phase shift the windings of the generator such that you can interface and uh, this, uh, make this ripple much less compared to what it is possible by carefully designing the generator windings. And as you can see here, if you design three of these passive ports with certain phase shifts, you can reduce the ripple on the overall uh, passive rectifier output by almost close to 2% or 3%. So that's another design which goes into this integrated approach. Now let's come to the uh, power flow control. Okay, I, probably all of us we know we know here that we want to achieve achieve this maximum power extraction at all of these wind speeds. So we want to achieve this uh, peak point at all of these wind velocities. But the fundamental question or the nightmare question here: the majority of the power is processed by the passive rectifier. How do we achieve control on the power? So there is an incoming power. And only control we can do is on this port. Nothing else we can control. Let's do remove one layer of abstraction for a second, OK? Let's see how we can solve this. So these are AC sources. These are the windings producing AC voltages. They have their own parameters. We are, for simplific uh, simplicity, let's consider one passive port and one active port. If we can control the active rectifier current here, OK, which we can. We can control the active rectifier current. Once we can control this current, and if I'm maintaining the DC bus voltage, I can control the DC bus current. If I can control the DC bus current, the diodes at each, depending on the voltage, which diode stands on, we can control the current on the diode bus. And that's what is the essence that even though we have so much passive rectifiers, we can still achieve power flow control. The simplicity of this, uh, again, still this architecture looks complex. So the way we looked at this system was a very simplified circuit model. The entire circuit boils down to this thing. We have a DC grid interface. Then there is a passive rectifier. So there is a back EMF 
produced, and that is a voltage produced by the back EMF. Then we have a commutation inductance. If you can go back to Kasakian's book here, there is a well-known equation which will give you the commutation inductance. And many of you have seen this in 464 probably. And the active rectifier, you can control the current. And by controlling the current, you can think about it this way. Okay, there are two things going on here. If you maintain the DC bus voltage, and if the passive rectifier voltage is governed by the generator speed, this voltage is determined based on that, okay, KVL. And if I can control the current, this voltage is maintained constant, whatever current I feed into this port has to go to the DC bus. And that's what exactly we did. Even though we don't have full control on the machine, by controlling the active port, we can achieve the power flow control. This is a standard inner loop control, nothing novel here, but we can control the active rectifier using DQ current controllers. And you can see here, one of the simulation, as we are changing the D-axis reference, which is our active power, uh, the current which governs the active power, you can see the active current goes up, and that is being reflected on the passive currents, even though we don't have actual control on it. We, uh, now we can wrap up our MPPT controller uh, in, uh, in addition to these current controllers on the outer loop, and we can achieve power flow control here. As you can see here, uh, we can change the D-axis current, it can match, the DC bus current, and based on that, we can do step changes in the power as well as the torque. The last piece of the question, is it practically feasible? So this is the funny part, and many of you might have seen when you were here, this was like back in early days when we didn't have the generator, right? We were not constructing the generator ourselves. We wanted to have the proof of concept. But the problem is we don't have a generator which gives us 18 phase out, okay? So we took a washing machine motor, we took apart all the windings, made it sure that we have access to all individual windings, and we put it together into our architecture. And you can see here some of the results from this low power prototype that we indeed see that the optimum where we can reduce the VA rating is not the conventional approach, but in this particular case, in this, in this prototype machine was two port. And the reason is when I showed you four port was the optimum, was an ideal system. This has its resistance and inductances. So we need to take care of those things. Uh, but that's how we can determine which port is optimum based on the parameters of the machine. And same thing with the power process compared to a conventional system, the proposed can pro needs to process less through the active rectifier and we can reduce the conversion loss as well within the speed range. And finally, we also achieve maximum power extraction here. As you can see here, uh, the maximum power happens somewhere around 400 watts, 650 RPM. So if we start the generator at somewhere around three, uh, uh, 400 RPM, gradually it will go to the 650 RPM based on the control. And as this speed is changing, the active rectifier will go down in voltage because we are going in higher speed and the passive rectifiers will be picking up the voltage so it will take the more share of the, the deceiling voltage such that the total deceiling voltage remains the same. So um, I, I, we can skip this way forward. So what is next? So the objective for us as a part of this ARPA-E project is to create world's most efficient, reliable and compact wind energy conversion system and where we are, there is a huge team right now working on this project. Many of you will remember some of these faces. Uh, there is, of course, Kiruba working with us on the generator side. Alejandro is helping us on the reliability side. George is helping us on the uh, economic analysis side. And there are a bunch of postdocs, graduate students. And of course, I must say that all the work which I presented uh, without their help would have been impossible. So a lot of work going on right now. Where are we at this point? We are building our 200 kilowatt uh, prototype. So we saw, saw something like from a benchtop prototype. This is the version we are building for a 200 kilowatt system. Uh, it has its own uh, silicon carbide based IG uh, converters and so on. And uh, we have started testing with some of the POET's test bed. Many of you may be familiar. Uh, it's an NSF center here. And we are trying to install this machine and general power electronics together. And these are some preliminary results at going up to 55 amps. 200 volt DC, 400 hertz, some of the preliminary results, but we are not there yet. Uh, hopefully over the summer, we will be able to put together the final test bed. There is another interesting thing happened. RPI was very happy with our progress. And they asked us to collaborate with a farm in UK. They are uh, called as Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. And we are right now collaborating with them uh, to create, come up with uh, architectures. How do we take this integrated generator rectifier and put it in an offshore environment and what are the hurdles there when we connect it to the grid so we are looking at some of those aspects in this collaboration 
So hopefully over the summer, we will be able to build this 200 kilowatt and we will be able to deploy this. It's a work in progress, but hopefully in another talk, I'll be able to give you guys update. So there are more references. Of course, you can go to IEEE Explore and you can take, take, take a look at some of the work uh, which has already been published. Uh, particularly uh, one of the earlier work, this one is talks about the basic architecture. This work talks about the maximum power extraction point. This one talks about an active voltage ripple compensation we can do. This talks about the machine design and this talks about the winding layout considerations. And there are some more publications in the pipeline. So hopefully uh, there are some more interesting work which is going to go out very soon. So let's summarize. We talked about three examples where we did integrated approach of machines, power electronics, and control. And as you can see here, uh, we can achieve something which is traditionally not feasible just by looking at, at the individual pieces of power electronics, machines, or control. And this integrated and customized way gives us new avenues to in, improve the power density, uh, reliability, and efficiency. I would like to really acknowledge very quickly my entire team here. These are my group students, and they work on different areas. And these are our funding agencies who have been very generous to support our direction of research. So thank you so much for listening to this talk. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Professor Banerjee. I'm going to turn off the recording uh, for the question session. Thank you.